What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome to the new headquarters. It's a shit show behind me. Um, still higher quality video than both of these two assholes that I'm doing this <laughs> video with. We have officially moved into the Manhattan apartment, but uh, no one can hang out with me for a long time. Obviously, we have been quarantined around the country for the most part. I mean, Mike, you're on lockdown. Noah, is, is Connecticut on total lockdown right now? No, not fully, but like everything is shut down and you're only allowed like one package of ground beef when you go to any store. So like it's basically <laughs> yes. locked down. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're all locked down all over the place except for necessities right now. So I can go to like shop right and shit, but I feel like people judge you. You're like, you're not, I'll leave your house unless you fucking need it. I'm like, bitch, I just want some, some lean ground beef. All right. I'm sorry. No more Corona talk. We are stuck inside, so we're going to try to pump out as many videos as we can for the near future. If we can get some live stream stuff going on, make sure you're following us on Twitch, Big Dogs Fantasy. We'll be doing some stuff on YouTube as well. Today, we have taken 12 random Dynasty questions from our Discord channel. If y'all are bored as fuck at home, this is the best way to get unbored. Go join the Discord channel, which is basically just like a giant forum or chat with everyone in the big dogs community talking dynasty NFL prospects about how the season's probably not even going to happen. So we're wasting our time, but it's fun for now until we hear otherwise that will be linked down below. You join it. It's completely free to talk. So go join discord. We took these questions from them. Michael, Noah, how we darn doing as well as we can in these times, I guess. Yeah, man, it's a total shit show. I really hope the NFL season doesn't get canceled, man. I think it might. Dude, it can't be. We're all hoping that. <laughs> I'd be so fucked. I'd be so, <laughs> I'd be so, so fucked. It can't be canceled. Now, the NFL owners are, are, are too greedy. I also think that um, they're starting to have tests that show the results within like an hour, I think. And within like four or five months, we'll definitely have those. So I think NFL owners will pay like $10 million to make sure that their players can get those before games. And if everyone gets cleared, then they could play and they could have fanless games. So worst case scenario, it's just a stadium with no one in there, which is fucking, as far as I'm concerned, that's perfect. Good for business, to be honest with you. Push it back a month. Let us fucking keep shooting out top sleeper videos and shit like that. I'm good to go. Y'all are good to go. So hit the intro. First question comes from our man, Koreshki. I think I pronounced that right. He asks, what are some common mistakes you see in startup drafts? And I know, Mike, you wrote down learning your league rules. And I would say you should probably know that before you even decide to join the league. But, Mike, what have you seen through your time playing Dynasty of people just messing up the draft by not knowing if it's PPR, half PPR, super flex, or whatever? Dude, I've, I've been in leagues where people have joined and George Kittle goes off the board in the first round. They're like, is this a tight end premium league? <laughs> like yeah man fucking tight end premium league <laughs> so uh, as, as as basic as that is that's like my number one piece of advice but uh just generally speaking um you know you want to people that first join dynasty they do it for trades right you love trading picks forwards backwards sideways and always about sundays but i would say that some people tend to over trade and that's when you kind of just like totally fuck yourself over and literally destroy value like to give you an example i once saw someone like trade up from the third and fourth to like draft Zeke and then like three rounds later trade Zeke away for like a sixth and ninth round pick which essentially erased two rounds of value this was Scott also. right <laughs> no it wasn't Scott <laughs> I just did it. Scott's the king of owning Scott has owned I think uh there's players within our leagues that he'll own five separate times like not, not holding them throughout the year but he'll trade them away get them back trade them away uh but to his credit he's got he's just started people in trades and his team uh, incredible <laughs> so i don't know if i know anyone that's better at trading anymore but that practice makes perfect so scott shout out to you yeah i think yeah, sometimes sure. scott just spin zones himself so much that he trades like the same pick over and over and gets worse value than when he first made the trade so <laughs> sometimes you got to look for that one thing i'll say that a lot of people make mistakes about is not reading the trade the picks that they get in the trade and accepting a rookie third when they thought it was oh, a startup okay. third and getting ruined for it. like it just Max. happened to yannick Yannick Snacks. Snacks has done it too. Yannick just traded. He thought he was getting the rookie 104. He got the rookie 109. He moved up from the 111 to the 109. And he moved back from like the startup 7 to like 11. So it was just a complete shit show. Always make sure you read what pick you're getting before you do it. Because it can really ruin your team before you know it. 
Yeah, if, if it's your first ever startup draft, it's going to seem like there are a lot of uh, a lot of things happening at once because there are going to be a lot of trades. There are going to be a lot of picks that you're not used to when it comes to ADP because this is Dynasty, so you're not seeing like the normal range of guys getting picked where they're supposed to be. So you might have a lot on your mind. So when you're seeing trades come through, you're going to see like the 109s, the 211s, the 711s, and shit like that. Understand that rookie drafts and startup drafts, the value of those picks, a second round pick in a startup draft is 38 times more valuable than the second round pick in a rookie draft. So when you accidentally hit accept, understand that your commissioner is not going to give you those fucking picks back unless he's a little bitch. I'd imagine if Mike ran a league, he'd give those picks back. <laughs> Hell no, dude. I don't give anything <laughs> yeah. back. You fuck up, you fuck up. That's, over. That's exactly. So listen, it, make sure that you are reading thoroughly through the picks because that could absolutely, like uh, in the, the Go Fade Me startup we did last year, Snacks did that. He thought he was getting like a second, third round startup pick. Ended up being like a future second, third round rookie pick. And that sets you back like legit years. Your team could be absolutely shocked because you're missing out now on someone that's, you know, an upper echelon wide receiver too for the rest of Dynasty and shit like that. So be very meticulous if it is your first time and you're seeing a lot of numbers be thrown around. Yeah, one thing I'll add to that is instead of thinking about a pick as like a number, try yes, and player. attach a player to that right. pick because sometimes like you think moving back one spot is bad, but for is like not that much. But for example, let's say you move back from like the 105 to the 106, you're moving from Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, MT to like the next tier of player, which is a huge drop off, right? And you wouldn't want to do that normally for like just a random second round rookie pick, which some people might do because they're like, oh, it's only one spot. It's not a big deal, right? So try and attach ranges of players based on ADPs and then think of it as like player for player trades versus like numbers for numbers. That's a really good, that's a really good point to, to give because most people who do dynasty leagues for the first time, rookie picks are or, trading in general, trading in general, rookie picks are very hard to value because you, you know, you have to have gone through a year, at least a year, usually like two years in a dynasty league to actually understand the value of picks and stuff. So when you do that, like go online somewhere and find where's like the best place to find. Is there anywhere that's like free to find Dynasty ADP right now? I think the fantasy football calculator might have it or four for four. I'm not sure. FFC kind of is so shitty with that. I feel like it's not, I don't know how often they update it, but go look uh, for somewhere. You might even have to sign up for like DLF or something like that, but find some Dynasty ADP, rookie ADP, even if it's last year's, I'm sure you could find free ones from last year and you'll be able to see like, oh, I'm getting the 206 what rookies were picked in that range and go back a couple of years because that will give you a sense for what those things are valued at. And then you can kind of move forward off that because when you just see numbers, it does get very confusing. And also on that point oh, for I'm you guys. Gonna... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry about that. Go ahead. I remember. What I was gonna say. Fucking kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also on that point for you guys that are starting up and then for you guys that are even like veterans have been doing this for a while. We have a lot of information that helps for overall strategy for dynasty and rookie drafts in the big dogs draft guide which is on pre-order sale right now, bigdogsdraftguide.com. We have uh, a sponsorship for the guide, which will allow you to get both the Dynasty Rookie Guide and the Season Long Guide for $10. That's bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKF. Uh, Mike is working on like an entire strategy video or entire strategy uh, article for startup drafts, especially when it comes to super flex drafts. We're going to have a, a lot of exclusive mock drafts. We'll get together like this, and that will be posted only inside the draft guide. Um, so everything you need to start up, everything you need for helping you trade and value and just like a player uh, write-ups and rookie prospect breakdowns and shit like that. We have been putting in a lot of work behind the scenes. So this shit will be absolutely worth it. Bigdogdraftguide.com slash MKF. What else we got? Number two question. Number two, something we don't cover in the draft guide, but we'll cover now is Bigus Dikas asks, cover tanking as a topic. How do you prevent it? Is it a legit strategy? I'll just start off by first saying, if you're one of those people that wants to tank and just leaves an empty lineup or starting like Chad Kelly over a legitimate starting quarterback, as a commissioner, I don't see how you can't go in there and tell the dude to like quit it because that takes no skill, right? There's a skill to tanking if you're going to sell your top assets. Like say I have a Julio Jones or like an Adam Thielen or a T.Y. Hilton and you know you want to tank, sell those guys to somebody that can use them. Like you're not trying to purposely help their team, but get assets in return that will allow you to tank sell them so you can start shitty players and get picks in return so you can build for the future. As for how you go about it as a commissioner, I would say don't make them always start best player available because that's super subjective. And on one week you might sit Stefan Diggs if like somebody else has a much better matchup than him, even though he's an objectively worse player. But uh, I would say that if, if it's, 
a repetitive thing and they just keep sitting their actual players for guys that aren't getting any playing time, you kind of have to step in and tell them that they have to have a better strategy than just giving all up and fighting for the one-on-one that way. I'm going to grab this real quick. Um, If I'm the commissioner and someone is tanking, I do want them like they can't be putting no one into their starting slots. Like they do have to be playing in order to get my attention as commissioner, they have to be playing guys who are playing on zero snaps or shit like that. Like guys that are not even reasonable fantasy assets. I'll step in and be like, bro, start your better players. But the the other problem with that is too, like if you want to tank, go ahead and fucking tank because I'm, I'm out here trying to fucking win. I'm out here trying to put money in the bank. All right. So if you want to take L's, like go and do that because that that's what like you you play to win that season, right? So if someone's gonna go fucking one in eleven or one in thirteen or whatever, great. Like that was your entire year. The other thing is if you can get the one oh one and that that one player, yes, he might be a Saquon Barkley, but there's a fifty fifty chance. I was going back through uh that that tweet that we referenced last week or two weeks ago, Ryan McDowell's ADP data, like two thousand twelve, Trent Richardson. This is overall one oh ones. Trent Richardson, the next year, Tavon Austin, the next year, Sammy Watkins. And like, yes, you will hit on a girly or a Zeke, but there's always a good chance. It's like 50-50 that you get a player that's really good or you get a player that's a bust. And if you just tanked an entire season to get a fucking Sammy Watkins, like, guess what? You're tanking the next year as well and the next year as well. So like, as far as I'm concerned as a commissioner, f- like, fuck off. Like, you can go tank all you want. I mean, I've, I've experienced this few across a couple of leagues. I'll say, first of all, if you're like starting, you know, like someone that doesn't even play over like a Julio Jones, I mean, you're a baby back bitch in my book because <laughs> that's that's weak as fuck. But there is strategy to tanking. Like, for example, when I realize that my team's not competitive, the worst thing to be in Dynasty is to be middle of the road because you're sitting there getting a middle of the road rookie picks every year and you're never going to turn your team around. But what you can do is sell off points, right? So, I like to sell off players for future draft picks. doesn't even matter like where it is. Like I'm just basically taking points off of my team and loading it in what I would call a storage capsule of value because the draft pick always increases in value. doesn't matter what year it is. It always increases in value. So if you can store value that way, that's how I think about tanking in terms of administratively, how you deal with this. If you're a commissioner and you are vehemently against tanking, make sure you outline in the rules. And then second to make it easy, Just put in a potential points system where the draft pick order is based on the potential points scored for your team. And both MFL and Sleeper have this function. And you basically just look at the end of the year and it tells you like what's your potential points for if you had started the best lineup every week, what would your team have scored? And that kind of gives you a good representation of like how bad the team is. And more often than not, the worst teams will get the best picks. Wait, so so you do your picks based off potential points in some leagues? Yeah. So what's and the point that, of playing? What's the point of the records? Well, well, no, because you, because you still got to manage the lineup to like win, right? Like, so like if you fuck up on your own lineup, that's like your problem. But like that could completely... so to get to the championship, the win loss records matter. But in yeah, 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 yeah. But in terms of draft picks, only the interesting, yeah. okay. only the bottom six teams. So if you're in a playoff, your potential points doesn't matter. You're that almost off. seems that's almost like best ball because the rosters are so yeah. big. Yeah, kind of, but like. It, it kind of removes that entire aspect of like, hey, I'm going to like spend Julio Jones for like, you know, freaking, I don't know, Nelson Aguilar because I want to. So that's interesting. The, the, you get no benefit from benching your players. And more often than not, it's a more accurate representation of like how strong your team is. Just because you fucked up or you decide to bench Julio Jones doesn't mean your team's weaker and should get a better pick. Basically. That makes sense. Yeah. That's crazy. All right. Moving on to the next one from our friend Mahaga04. When drafting backups, do you target floor or ceiling? What mix do you use? Uh, we'll kick it over to Mike for this one because I think he has a good answer. Oh, fuck. For yeah. Uh, so the way, I, the way I build my drafts is I try and get the floor early on in the draft. So I pick safer assets in the first, first one to five, maybe one to four rounds, I would say. And then once you get into like a backup rounds, like seven, eight, nine, I basically no longer care about floor anymore. Um, not to say I don't care about floor at all, but like I weigh ceiling way more heavily because you want those guys to be like potential like league winners, not like roster cloggers, which you just like basically sit on your bench the entire time. That's yeah, Mike, my... Like putting a player behind that, would you rather a Jarvis Landry or a Michael Gallup at that point? Because they're valued very similarly, I'd say in Dynasty, but it's more of a floor versus ceiling there. Yeah, I'd rather have Michael Gallup in that scenario. Especially, especially if you've built your team right. Like if you invested in the right assets, like those workhorse running backs, with a lot of touches, 
wide receivers, a lot of touches, like those great QBs, like that's how you build your floor. You're not going to get your floor of like, nobody cares about 10 points or 11 points and at the end of the bench, like that's not going to win you the league. Yeah. I think, uh, it depends what your team has built up to that point. Like, for instance, I had a startup draft last year where my first two picks were Joe Mixon, Melvin Gordon. So when I targeted, like, I don't target other people's backups. I targeted mine because Dynasty is a lot, like, in redraft, I'm, I probably wouldn't end up doing that because I don't care. But, like, this worked out for me, right? Like, I, I took Geo and I took Eckler probably in, like, the 12th or 13th round because I wanted to make sure I was safe, right? Obviously, one of them popped off and it was great. The other one is kind of irrelevant right now, but I still have Mixon, so that's fine. Now, when you're looking at like other other uh, potential league mates as like running backs and whatnot, I'm not really looking to grab those guys. Like you said, I'd rather uh, reach for a guy that can pop off and have a ceiling there rather than just have a floor sitting there. Because if your starting running back ends up getting hurt, you know you're kind of fucked because you don't know. Like the thing with dynasty too is like injuries. Yes, they could lead to like one thing or another in the very short term. But there could be a, a like a very long severity of like what happens with one injury, like a four or six week injury could end up being like the reason a guy got benched and then their backup ends up being like the next guy up in line. So Aaron Jones. I think exactly like when I think of uh, getting my guys, I always want their backups in dynasty. I don't necessarily target other people's backups um, just for the sake of like handcuffing. If I'm drafting someone that's a backup, it's strictly for ceiling. Yeah, last year I took Andrew Luck in like the third round of a startup Superflex in round 15. I took Jacoby Brissett, and then I just traded him. So if I had done that, there would have been no value to that trade because there was talks of him retiring. I think I got Baker for that. So yeah, as Nick was saying, like if especially if it's like an injury-prone guy like a Melvin Gordon, you know he's injured, and we've seen Austin Eckler be able to step up. Like sometimes you got to reach on them because after round like eight or nine, there's really no ADP. You just get the guy that you want because at that point it's people just either shooting for upside or getting guys that they like and. You know, there's a very good chance that an Austin Eckler is somebody that somebody wants to reach on. Have you guys I, – I still have Andrew Luck rostered in one of my Same, leagues. dude. I have him everywhere. I have him everywhere. I'm, I'm still holding him, bro. I don't know hey. why, but I'm just going to do that. Fuck Patriots, it. baby. Come on, Bill. We're gonna Patriots, <laughs> Indy, bro. Just bring him fucking anywhere. Yeah, to replace, dude, anybody instead of Phillip Rivers, I'm fine with that. I don't want to turn on my TV on a Sunday and see that side slinging whatever. Imagine he was like – imagine the Colts reached out to Luck this offseason. They were like, we want you back. And he was like – all right, but for one year, you got to sign Philip Rivers because he's going to look like shit and make me look way better when I come back. <laughs> and that's where we're at right now. So, Nick, that you heard it here first. 20, 2021, well, actually, we might have to wait till 2022. If Rivers has to – we cancel this season. Rivers has to play the season after that. Then luck is coming, bike. We figured it out. <laughs> Love that. Hold on to luck. Next question by Three Green Elephants. At what point do you consider drafting – rookies we'll start off with nick at what point do you consider drafting rookie running backs like a jonathan taylor or a deandre swift if they're included in the startup uh i would go, d depending it's very subjective to the rookie but there's no limit to it like uh i i, I did a startup draft two years ago and um mike i want to say the one we're in the guy yes yeah, the person that was in it took barkley 101 his rookie year admittedly i wouldn't have done it it's a very risky pick but looking back that's a fucking gangster pick you know and i don't think there's any uh limit to where you can draft a rookie i personally do tend to play it a little bit on the safer side but i think we've seen over the last like five years that when we know a prospect is really like as good as as he is you know we've seen like the zeke's come out and the barclays come out and we're pretty sure that they're going to be very legit running backs i'm like for instance depending on what's going to happen is those top four backs that we all love so much, like one, if not two, maybe even three of them are going to end up on surprise teams that we didn't expect in really shitty situations. But one of them is going to end up landing in a fucking beautiful spot. If JT goes to, you know, the, the Chiefs or whatever, like there's no reason not to take him top five. For real, like you think about it, and we've seen recently what's happening with these running back contracts. Like make a case for him to not be chosen ahead of like a Dalvin Cook, somebody who's dealt with injuries and has like one to two years left. And we know Dalvin Cook is a known commodity, but what's to say that one year down the line, Jonathan Taylor just isn't the best running back in football. Like we've That's the way I look at it too. Yeah. Like in what's more likely in one year that like, you, you know, if you don't want to take Jonathan Taylor at like the one twelve because he's a rookie, there's almost 0% chance that his value doesn't go up from this year. So if he goes at the, the 203 next year in startup drafts you already know he's going to be like the 107 or the 103 like just account for that leap now yeah dude even trent richardson like his value went up after his first year even though he was trash you remember like he, just because he got volume like if you're in a first round running back you get volume like it's good and i think it's like you said right try not to think about it in terms of a number try and attach a player to it 
and see where that player slots in in your rankings. Like this year, you have a very strong running back class. I would not be surprised at all if Jonathan Taylor or DeAndre Swift, one of them makes it into the first round ADP in a single Yeah. Season. I would be surprised if one of them didn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've been kind of thinking that he's going to land – Jonathan Taylor's going to land in Tennessee and play that Derrick Henry to DeMarco Murray role and just take yeah. over next year. And honestly, if that happens, I, I don't know. Maybe it's hard to take him in the first round because you're not expecting a work, workhorse role uh, year one. But year two, like, he could legitimately be, like, a top five or six running back. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah, Imagine yeah, them two fun. lined up in, in, like, a wishbone formation. <laughs> like, them two just in the backfield, both huddled down. I'd, I'd walk off the field if I was a linebacker. I'd be like, fuck this. Yeah. They have, like, the if 23rd Taylor, pick. It's realistic. If Taylor goes there, uh, that might be, like, I think I don't think Harry Henry can hold out. Because if he holds out, he'd be like, fuck, I'm going to lose my job. It's like, yeah, it's going to be Wally Pipped like Melvin Gordon all over again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How about for wide receivers? I know last year in one of my startups, people were taking, like, A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf around, like, 9 and 10, which is a great steal right now. But when you think about it, right, a lot of these receivers don't really return value year one and year two. And I would say, if anything, 2019 was kind of an anomaly with all these guys returning value. So, Mike, where do you see yourself taking a C.D. Lamb or a Jerry Judy in a startup draft among other wide receivers? Honestly, it's, it's probably around that range, right? Because that's when you're getting your, like, wide receiver four, like wide receiver, wide receiver three, four, where you're not immediately depending on them to start. If I think back to the D.J. Moore class, I think I drafted D.J. Moore in, like, the eighth round uh, back in that class. He was my wide receiver one. And he had like first round capital and all that stuff. So I think in that like eight to 10 range is where you're looking at rookie wide receivers. And there's a huge gap between the wide receivers and the running backs. Because again, like you got to think about the players. That's why when it's like someone gives you a rookie 1.01 to versus like a rookie 1.05, it's like Jonathan Taylor or DeAndre Swift to CD Lamb. But in startup capital, you're talking like four or five rounds, like even later. Yeah, it's crazy when you look at it that way. Like you said, like there, that's really important. Like tiers are important from converting rookies to dynasty. Because like you said, in a rookie draft pick, you know, like Cam Makers might be the 104, but he might be like a third round startup pick. The 105 could be that first wide receiver off the board. He might not go to the, like the eighth or ninth round. So it's very important to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. I mean, uh, again, it's it's kind of subjective. I, I Unless I love a receiver, like a uh, – I wasn't doing dynasty when Julio Jones came out, but I'd imagine he was like a really high startup pick just because he was so like prototypical and he had nothing bad on his profile whatsoever. Um, so I'd imagine someone like him would go really high, but the rest of it is it's tough because I don't want to say that they're riskier than running backs, but you, you, I, they are because when a running back enters a league one, as soon as they enter the league, they're basically in their prime, maybe not the rookie year, but like their second year, they're off to the races. They're right in their prime wide receivers. You know, it could take a couple of years. Like, they might not necessarily take a couple of years to like break out, but in order to return any sort of like elite fantasy value, it usually takes like three, four or five years. Those first two years are like, if you have a good, good rookie year, it's, you know, 650, 700 yards. Then you take that next step, 950 yards. Then you take like the 1200, 1300 yard mark. That's if you're on your way to like elite status. So it takes a few years to return that value, which is why even if, you know, you know, you're getting a top 12 running back or a top 12 wide receiver. The, the top 12 running backs a little bit more valuable just because you don't have to wait those couple of years in order to get them. Yeah. Like one, a, tip, one tip I would give is like, think about this time next year, who do you think is going to gain more value? Like a Michael Gallup or a CD lamb? Sure. CD lamb can have an AJ Brown or DK Met, Metcalf type of rookie season and become a fourth round starter pick next year. But me personally, if I'm playing it safe, the chances that Michael Gallup repeats what he did last year, in my opinion, is greater than CD lamb going out and putting up 1200 yards and 10 touchdowns as a rookie. So if it was between those two and I'm on the clock, I'd probably just go Michael Gallup and then next year maybe just flip Gallup for C.D. Lamb and another piece like you could do with Nikhil Harry now. Yeah, I'd say um, the, the risk profile between wide receivers and uh, running backs for rookies is like actually – it just like depends on what you want, right? Because running backs are more likely to return value in one year, but if they flop, their value fucking tanks. Like, yeah. Yeah wide receiver like people know that you know it takes more time you can be more patient like i remember Corey davis held his like first of all Corey davis <laughs> yeah. like a four, he's like a fourth round startup adp as a rookie and he held like that value for like two years even though he didn't really do much yeah, whereas like point. if you look at someone like rashad penny like like guys even even though they due to injury like their value just totally fucking tanked and one last thing i'll say is what i did last year for rookie quarterbacks is i waited until preseason to see how these guys progress and I know Mike's has heard this story but I ended up flipping Baker Mayfield for Kyler Murray a second two thirds and a fourth because after his second preseason game he just looked like absolute shit and people were mocking me and then two weeks into the season it was just a complete bloodbath now you may have fallen into the Daniel Jones hype train but even then Daniel Jones is a very good fantasy quarterback even though he's not good in real life so 
especially this year with like all the whole coronavirus stuff and these players not being able to build chemistry with their teams, which I also say might affect wide receivers not being able to build chemistry with their quarterbacks, might provide a good buying opportunity when they're not just showing you know, a leap from the college to the pro level right away because it does take time. And you got to realize that these prospects don't just become shit after one week unless you're like Jake Locker or Blaine Gabbert. So I think that provides a good opportunity to buy in the preseason if they start to underperform and you can get a package like that for a proven player that, you know, one or two years down the line, you don't think is going to be much different than like a Kyler Murray or a Baker Mayfield. Next up, we have Banana Joe. He asks, what is your suggestion for Dynasty Startup Draft? Focusing on young players to destroy in a couple of years or getting older, more routine guys? Michael, kick it over to you. What do you like to do? You like to go with the youngins like uh, R. Kelly or you like to go a little older? Uh, for me, it just, it just depends on how the draft falls to me within the first three rounds. So that's what I was going to say. Like first like five really, or six rounds. Yeah. I never really go into it being like, yo, I'm going to rebuild and wait two years or yo, I'm going to win right now. So like for, to give you an example, like last year, depending on where I was drafting, it would, it would like, I would either get like Juju Smith Schuster or like a Devonte Adams. Right. And if I got a Juju Smith Schuster, who I targeted a lot, it gave me a lot of flexibility of what I want to do the rest of the draft. So I would like trade back a lot. I love trading back because I like getting as many top 100 players as possible. Uh, so I don't like putting all my eggs in like stud baskets at the top because of one injury and you're fucked. And I play in very deep starting rosters. So like 11 to 12 players. So I think it really depends. Um, but what I do th- what I do say is I tend to buy assets that I think can appreciate in value early on. So more your patented draft pick. Yeah, exactly. So like whether it's draft picks or younger players, like that's kind of what I focus on at the top. And then later on, like there's a ton of value for veterans um, in startup drafts. Yeah, I, I would agree with it depending on how the early start of your draft goes, because I, I would say like the first five or six rounds, you'll you'll about know what your starting roster is going to look like. And if you, you know, say you're like wide receiver one is 22 years old, like Juju you have some room to work with, with who your, you know, your wide receiver three and your first flex is going to be, um, for instance, like Juju. And then you can, you can pair that with a guy like Julian Edelman, knowing that you have youth behind it. Right. And then once you have that, then you can get some younger wide receivers that are, you know, more upside and things like that. But if you start off your wide receiver one is say Julio, you put yourself in a little bit of a box there because you can't go Julio and then Julian Edelman, which is literally exactly what I did in the go fade me league. But <laughs> kind of bit me in the ass I just flipped Adam I actually want to talk about the trade I just did in a little bit and I'll get your guys thoughts on, on it which is kind of relevant to what we're talking about right now um but when, once you start like maneuvering through the first few rounds you'll understand like the ages of the guys on your team and then what you could do I would say when it comes to age like don't worry about it too much until later on in the draft but you can kind of maneuver around it once you get there I think if you start off early and you get young guys in the beginning, then you give yourself a little bit more flexibility. But it's not going to be like the only thing. I would just say starting off with older guys puts you in a little bit of a hole because you don't have as much flexibility on the back end. Yeah, and you'll see people completely devalue what is considered like older wide receivers, like an Adam Thielen. And I'm pretty sure he's part of the the trade that you made. But like Adam Thielen is 29 or 30 years old, but he's playing in the slot. What's to say he doesn't have two or three more wide receiver one, wide receiver two seasons in him? And on top of that, people will say like a Mike Evans or a Devontae Adams are older commodities. They still have like four more seasons in their absolute prime. So I agree with Nick, what Nick said, like grab maybe an A.J. Brown or Cortland Sutton or one of those younger guys early so you can leverage that with a later older guy uh, like Julian Edelman or even a T.Y. Hilton, even though he's injured, but he's somebody that can give you value. Or even like a John Brown in round 12, who was very good last year. He's made the wide receiver two on that offense now, but still like, it gives you so much more flexibility when you start to build a little bit younger and then having those older guys, like even in a tight end premium league, grabbing a slightly older tight end. I know last year it wasn't a great move, but like a Delaney Walker a little bit later or Greg Olson in like round 18 where people aren't even thinking about that. And they're just going for upside, just having the ability to have a safe floor with guys in rounds that most of the time aren't going to hit anyways. Yeah. With those older guys, like again, going back to like, say you went Julio in the second round, which you're not going to do anymore. But like last year, he was a second round, like late second round pick. I think if you do end up doing that, then, you know, you almost have to reserve two or three rounds through like seven through 11 or 12, where you're targeting those early. And then might be rookie picks. Maybe that's where you start to target. Like last year, if you went Julio, you could, you could target the Deontay Johnsons, the Terry McLaurins, the Cortland Suttons, and hoping that one of them hits and can kind of take over that, that Julio role. 
But here's the trade I did. So Thielen was someone I gave away. It was Melvin Gordon, Adam Thielen, and uh, do you remember? And, and uh, Hayden Hurst for Nick Chubb, straight up. Now I know. Well, I believe I won that trade with ease. And this was prior to Melvin Gordon signing with Denver. We didn't know where any of them were going that were still free agents at the time. Hayden Hurst was on Atlanta. Uh, we didn't know where Melvin Gordon was going to land. And in the comment section, there were people like, oh, Melvin Gordon is going to end up in like Tampa Bay or whatever. And I was like, you have no idea if that's going to happen. Like fantasy people always tend to project the best case scenario because it's fun why not but when you're trading you got to take advantage of that shit the way I look at Melvin the way I look at Adam Thielen those are the two key pieces of the trade and then Nick Chubb which what is more likely to happen Nick Chubb's value goes down after this year or it goes up oh uh, that's what the other two they're both older like there's no way that either of those two assets is dynasty values go up after this year they might that you know we could look back at that trade after this one year and say that Oh, they won in redraft. Like Adam Thielen and Melvin Gordon were both very good in redraft. But guess what? No matter what they do, because of their age, their value is going down going into startup drafts next year. 100% agree. Was that pre or post Stefan Diggs being traded? Uh, I don't remember, to be honest. Yeah, I would just say maybe if you're looking at it now, you would say, oh, he lost because you could trade it for more. But when you can get a workhorse. I actually player, think I actually think it was uh, post post Stefan Diggs trade, but it made no fucking difference to me. I just wanted to ship off Adam Thielen and Melvin yeah. Gordon. You're getting a 23 or 24 year old running back on an offense that completely just helped out their offensive line with Conklin. And they have a very good offensive or running mind in Kev Kevin Stefanski there. And you're shipping off a 27 year old running back who's now on a different team who hasn't played a full 16 games. And like, he's done it like once in his entire career. So I, I mean, now it. he's going to share, he's just, he's just going to be in a backfield. But like, yes, Gordon is definitely going to lead the backfield, but it's just like, there's no way that his value goes up. And with Chubb, it's just like, also Kareem Hunt got the transition tag. Yes, but what's to say they're going to sign him to a deal next year? Like if he's gone, yeah. then Nick Chubb's value fucking skyrockets. Yeah, I don't, I, I think that I, like that I love that deal a lot. I think people are just way too worried about Nick Chubb and like, they're just way too worried about this year for him. Like, I think if, if you had to make that trade, like, you're basically – you have to ride Gordon and Thielen to, to the dirt, right? Like, you're not going to be able to trade him after this year. At least yeah, anything. Yeah, th that's, that's the thing, too. And I was like, I, I'm not confident in them right now. I do have, like, a Julio on my team who I'm like, fuck, you know, I'd, I wish I could trade him right now. But yeah. he'll put up good enough points to the, to the fact that I'll be happy if I ride him into the sunset. Yeah. But with the other two, I'm like, dude, if Melvin Gordon gets into a, a, a backfield committee and he gets, like, 195 touches or 210 touches even, like – you're, he, he has no value left. Like, it's yeah. right now or it's never, you know? So I was like, yeah. fuck this. Get him off Yeah, they had a sell window as opposed to Julio Jones who doesn't. Like, once Diggs leaves, people are hyped up about Thielen. Once Melvin Gordon's exactly. about to hit the open market, there's a window for him. So I think that also kind of transitions well into the next question somehow, just talking about Nick Chubb's value. Westron asks, what's a better strategy in a startup dynasty? Using your first rounder or trading your first rounder for extra early, early picks, like a first for a second and a third? I'll say right now, if you're not like a top four or five pick and you can pull off a one for a two and a three, you do it 100% of the time because that's basically like Dalvin Cook for Nick Chubb and DJ Moore. And when you assign those names to those picks, you realize like how valuable that trade is. If someone were to offer you that, not with the numbers attached, but just the names, you would smash accept right away. If you're starting a, a startup draft with your friends this summer, this year, and this is all your guys' first time doing it, you will be able to take advantage of this Pro over and over and over again throughout the startup draft. If you offer your first round pick to somebody, somebody's going to take it for way more value than they should be giving up because the just having the one attached to the pick, it could be the 112 as opposed to like the 203, which is three spots and probably the same value of a player. People jump at that shit. You can draft, you could do your startup draft without your first round pick. I promise you, you'll be fine. I know Mike likes to, you know, compile all the picks that he can get within the top 50, 100, whatever it is over there. So, yeah, I love trading back. Um, even if you have a top five pick, like I've seen picks where it's like you trade the 1.01 or the 1.02, which is like, you know, Mahomes or CMC, and you'll get a second rounder, a third rounder, and a fifth rounder. And I will smash that every single day of the week because that's three starters, three locked in starters for one. And you just like, especially if you play in like the deeper leagues where you have to start like 10 to 11 guys, you'll start noticing like that is a huge fucking difference. And the other part of it is, you know, Nick said this before, 
we like to buy assets that can increase in value. As good as CMC is, as godly as Mahomes is, as good as Barkley is, their value is not going to increase. But if you if you hit the right guys in those second, third, and fourth round, they can become the next like Barkley, the next Dalvin Cook. So over time, like you have way more upside on the value and the production versus just picking that first round pick. Yeah, here's a trade that, well, it's not a trade that happened, but here's something that in our starter draft right now, I'll just say the names and then I'll tell you what the picks were after. Would you rather have DeAndre Hopkins or Allen Robinson and A.J. Brown? Obviously the second two. Yeah. That is the difference between the 110 and the 3, 8, and 5, 9. It's a That's super inc- flex league. So you might not think, you know, a 1 for a 3 and a, and a 5 is a what great What were they pick. again? What, what were the, the picks of the other two? 3, 8 for A.J. Brown and 5, 9 for A-Rob. Oh, yeah. man. That's devastating. How do, those, how do those guys go that late? I love it that. It is a super flex league. So they get pushed a little bit back. But, like, tight, yeah. it's a tight end premium, but only three tight ends were in between those picks. So, you know, once those quarterback runs start to happen, so much value gets pushed back. That sure, you might miss out on a quarterback or two, but you can get AJ or not AJ Brown. You can get Allen Robinson in almost the sixth round, a guy who yeah. caught like 95 balls. Left. That's crazy. That's, that's why you always trade back too in super flex. Because people are always like, Oh, I want to get the stud, I want to get the stud. And then what they realize is later on, all this talent gets pushed back, and they're like, Oh shit, I need to like trade back into this value. And then that's where you start accumulating like future rookie picks, where they like trade you like a seventh and a first to get into like the fifth or something like that. So that's also why you trade back because like you just want to have a lot of picks in those. Trade guys. all your picks. Trade all your picks and tank your fucking season. That's what, <laughs> what I will say. Is you. If you want to go on the Discord? We're currently like updating our draft every day and like doing a recap and posting pictures of the draft board, so you guys can get a real gauge on where these guys are being picked. Like mock drafts are different because there's no money behind it. Like this is a hundred dollar league, so people are actually trying to draft to win, and you can see kind of where guys are going in this different format. So that will probably be how many different. how many startup drafts have we done so far? Uh, through the big dogs discord or just like the big dogs slack plus discord together 11 but they're not all filled but there's like 11 cues and i think like yeah. eight of them are actually starting damn okay see yeah like but so we were talking prior to filming and mike suggested that we start compiling adp data and give it to you guys because we run throughout through the discord we run a ton of mock drafts there's always someone trying to start up a mock draft so you guys can practice your startup drafts and if we can start like compiling all the uh we can start compiling all the ADP data from the mocks, but obviously real startup drafts would be better because you get a better uh, sense of, of ADP based on people actually paying money versus the mock drafts. Um, that would be cool. So that's something we are working on behind the scenes. As soon as we uh, can figure out how to get that together, then, uh, then we'll get that out to you. Very helpful. Join the Discord. That's the main takeaway. Join while it's free, <laughs> which will probably be for a while for now. Yeah, uh, we'll keep it open. <laughs> Next up, we have our boy, Todd Walter. He's, he asks... How much of a bump and when do you start to consider the top tight ends in a tight end premium super flex league? I don't know why it says super flex, but let's just say a tight end premium league. Let's say it's a, uh, a half PPR league and tight ends get an extra half on top. Nick, where do you start to take the Kelsey's and the Kittles and the Mark Andrews of the world? I'll be honest. I've actually never, I'm not in any dynasty leagues with uh, tight end premium. I've only played a few redrafts that are tight end premium. They are not my specialty. So I will defer that to Michael. So, the biggest misconception on tight end premium is that all tight ends get a bump in value. And that's just far from the truth. What actually happens is the disparity between the elite tight ends and like those mediocre middle of the road and the later tight ends just grows. So the way to think about it is if you miss out on the top, like two to three elite guys, like if you miss out on Kittle, Kelsey, and I would say probably Andrews don't like, don't shift your ranks to like draft tight ends early on. What you can do is, just pump a bunch of late round tight ends later at value. That's probably the best way to do it. And if I were to draft today, like in that 0.5 to one PPR ratio, which means that you're getting double the points for reception for tight ends, I'm taking Kittle like within the top eight picks. Easy. So it's like the opposite of a one quarterback league where you're waiting on quarterbacks because at the end of the season, their points per game are so close that there's no value in picking one five rounds earlier. Whereas in the tight end, the top guys are so much more valuable than the other guys. Same thing. That's like similar to running backs. Having an elite running back in fantasy, at least in regular leagues, is probably the biggest disparity you can have over your league mates. So um, I guess that holds true with elite tight ends and tight end yeah, premium. Because if you think about it, those middle of the road tight ends, like how do they get there? They score like a couple TDs more than the next guy, right? So like, where do you where where would you value a guy like uh, like Kelsey, where he's obviously an elite option, but his age is starting to get up there? Um, so he's kind of like in that same conversation as Julio. If you pick Kelsey early, like where he should go is mm-hmm. in the second round, right? But if you pick Kelsey, 
you're locked into win now because you got to like build to win and capitalize in those last two years or three years, whatever it is. Right. But if you get someone like Andrews, which is why I prefer Andrews over Kelsey, even though he's not as good, he's still very young and it kind of keeps your trap open. And that's why Kittle's like, was such, it was such a clear cut like tier. It's like Kittle and then like everyone else. And Kittle's yeah, like the sense. one that I would take in the first. Okay. Yeah, in the draft I'm in right now, I took both Andrews and Ertz. Ertz is obviously an older asset. I took Ertz at 503, and at that point, he's yeah. going after guys like Drew Locke, who are people's quarterback threes. You're not starting a Drew Locke week to week. You're starting a Zach Ertz, who's probably you know going to turn into a top 12 wide receiver type of value. Sure, he's a bit older, but you get value for these top end guys. And I think Mike was saying it before. These these tight ends who finish like tight end six to tight end 12, these like supposed tight end ones, they get there by way of touchdown. Tight end premium leagues give you extra points for receptions. It's not really helping them all that much. And I looked at the numbers, tight ends one through six averaged 83 receptions this year. Tight ends six through 12 averaged 56 and a half receptions this year. So that's a difference of almost 30 points just off of receptions alone, not even considering the extra yards they get from those receptions on top. And I also looked at the tight end 12 this year. It was uh, Jason Witten, who is now a Las Vegas Raider. If you turned him into a wide receiver, you ranked him amongst wide receivers, he would have ranked behind Larry Fitzgerald last year. So those lower end tight end ones, obviously you're not drafting Jason Witten in dynasty leagues very high, but if you end up with a guy that's a tight end 12 in a tight end premium league, that's not really giving you all too much value when you can get a guy who's going to be a wide receiver three, probably much later when you go to reach four, who's going to be a tight end 12. Yeah. Noah Fant could very realistically be in that tight end 10 to tight end 12 range. And people are paying like fifth round startup ADP for him, which is just like pretty wild to me. Like if you think about it this way, like, I, I did an article last year, like when I first started doing this stupid fantasy jig um, about like the tight end strategy and I showed it to Nick. And basically if you opened with tight end, tight end, if you're drafting from late in the draft, you got like Kittle and Kelsey, for example, that made your team like a monster because what happens is in tight end premium, Kittle and Kelsey score as if they're like a wide, top five wide receiver, but you get it in the tight end slot. So you get a huge advantage in that slot, whereas you can find more replaceable wide receivers to fill up that wide receiver two production in your wide receiver slot. So that's like a strategy that I like and tight ends last pretty long. So it works out pretty well. But this year, instead of doing Kelsey Kittle, you could do something like Andrews plus Kittle. Um, but it only works if you're dropping the back part because you don't want to take Kittle at like 1.01. Yeah, and there's there's like no depth to tight end either. Like, are you really comfortable taking Evan Ingram who just can't seem to stay healthy? Sure, he's going to turn out like eight really good games. But after that, are you sure? Like, the team has come out and said they're not too confident. Even Austin Hooper, who was awesome last year, like, do we know he's going to get a big share of the pie in Cleveland with that offense being mainly run heavy and having so many mouths to feed? Like, there's a big drop off after like the top five or six guys that if you get those, you get such a big advantage in your league. Yeah, I like the idea of like going off Austin Hooper. I would rather target a David Njoku whose value skyrockets downwards, right? He's crashing right into the fucking floor. You can get him eight rounds later. But Njoku, he can't be staying in Cleveland for long. By the time, here's what's going to happen. He's either going to get traded or he's going to sign with a new team when his rookie deal is up. And when he goes to the new team, he's going to be like 23 or 24 years old and still has that elite athleticism profile it just takes one year for him to break break out. One situation where he's comfortable, where they want to use him in that athletic, you know, mold. And David Njoku is right back to that top twelve, top ten conversation. How about this, Eric Ebron? Right, this year yeah. he had a down year. Now he's in Pittsburgh. That it's a team that wants to use the tight end. He's still what, like twenty six years old. He's former like top ten pick. He's probably going to score. Probably not close to Hooper, but I wouldn't write him off as not being a tight end one this year. And you know, last year in startup drafts or even after the season ended, if he did an early startup. You probably get them at a huge distance. That's that's the thing with with tight ends too uh, that I'm starting to notice more and more. You have to be like really conscious about their age because tight ends, like apart from the top elite guys, when you're starting to target the guys that are later in later in the draft, the situation matters so much more than the talent of a player. There are so many athletic tight ends in the league, but like Eric Ebron, right? Like he could not do anything in Indy, and then he goes to Pittsburgh and becomes like a very serious player in that offense. Like think about Jared Cook, how many like good years he's had how many bad years in between that and then another good year again. Like, it's so situational for those guys. So make sure, like, again, like Eric Ebron just turned 27 years old. Like, he probably has two or three good fantasy seasons left in his career, and I have no idea if they're going to happen in Pittsburgh. They could happen on the next team, you know what I mean? So, like, be conscious. When, when the tight ends start getting to, like, 32 – around that age, probably 31, 32, 33, then probably start avoiding them. But like these other guys who are going to start dropping in value because they start changing teams coming off a bad year, like they could easily start putting up decent numbers for your team again. 
Yeah, watch out for Jimmy Graham this year. Young dude, <laughs> athletic, new team. Stop. Stop. All right, next question. We got Big Bubby 69 Love that name. It's kind of similar to what we already touched on, but when is the time in the start of draft to shoot for upside versus taking proven players? And I kind of want to reword this because we talked about whatever, like when Mike starts shooting for upside, but like at what point do you just throw ADP completely out the window and you start going for guys that you believe in like a Preston Williams or whatever? We'll, we'll kick it over to Mike first. I time. basically stopped worrying about ADP after like seven or eighth round um, because the chance of you hitting on most of those guys are like pretty low anyways. And like, uh, why would I care about what someone else thinks versus what I think about a player? Um, that's not to say like, the ninth round comes around. I'm just going to click the smash button on Preston Williams. Cause I know he, I can still get him in like the 12th or around or later, but like, I'm not worried about like reaching for my guy who I love other people think is like a ninth round value, but I draft him in the seventh or the eighth. Like if I can't find a trade down, I'll just take him. Yeah. I'll probably do something similar to that. Um, when I'm shooting for upside again, it's usually later on in the draft because you need your, your foundation of really good players on your team that are going to last for a while. So you don't want to be throwing darts early on. Uh, when it gets later into the draft, yeah, you start start going for the guys that you want. Because like Mike said, like if you're going to just start throwing darts, why, why, have, why like, choose someone else's? Like You might as well, if you're going to go down with the ship, take your guy. Yeah. I've taken way too many Brandon Cooks in like the eighth round to start <laughs> taking other people's guys and following ADP. At this point, I'm fully bought in. Uh, another <sighs> strategy I have comes from Ryan Stewart. He's asking, if you're in a startup and all the elite quarterbacks go before your first pick, do you panic and grab one from the next tier because of the immense value or fade the position and load up on other players that fell? Me personally, I'm notorious for leaving drafts without a quarterback at all and just trading. <laughs> it's like, it's so stupid. But this past draft, we were just like, I'm playing mind games. I don't know what's going on. I talked people into drafting Drew Locke, and then I take Kirk Cousins. <laughs> in one draft I did earlier, I left the draft of my quarterback one being Tyrod Taylor, and then I flipped, like, the rookie 204 <laughs> for Kirk Cousins, and guess who has two starting quarterbacks now? So me personally, I'm not – Not you play. still. <laughs> not <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, I personally – well, I have Taysom Hill too, so we'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> it's like a negative. Now you have fucking zero starting quarterbacks. Uh, I personally, if people aren't falling at value, like we just brought up with Allen Robinson earlier, would I rather have Allen Robinson or Drew Locke? Give me Allen Robinson any day of the week because I don't know any rational person that would turn down a trade of getting, at this point at least, Allen Robinson for Drew Locke one for one. And that's a trade that you can make early, even if you have to throw like a rookie fourth round pick into it, even if being super flex, like you can only start two quarterbacks. By the time like the league starts and people start realizing that Drew Locke is doing them no good on their bench, whereas Allen Robinson is a wide receiver one winning you weeks. I think that people start to understand the value of not not loading up so heavily on quarterbacks that aren't all too good to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for grabbing the star of quarterbacks, a lot of them in startup drafts. Um, but this – startup drafts are funny, man. They they go, like, such weird ways, like, very quickly. I'm always like, yeah, I want to grab, like, two of my starting quarterbacks round three, round five or whatever before I know it's round nine and I only have, like, one viable quarterback on my roster. Uh, so – I would say just like don't panic. You do have to go with the flow in a sense. Uh, don't reach for the quarterbacks. But know going in that a lot of the times when you leave the startup draft, if you have extra quarterbacks, their value in trade is is so much higher after the draft. People devalue them. And then as soon as it's done, they'll end up trading more than they drafted to get that quarterback that they could have just drafted for less than they gave away. Yeah, I will also sure. say you start to see other guys fall and you're like, oh, wow, this is a really good value. But then you also have to realize it's a value because one of the more – a bigger necessity is coming off the board. And then maybe you have to reach on a quarterback. But even at that point, one of your future picks is also going to be a value at wide receiver or running back or tight end because so many quarterbacks have still gone. Like you're still in the same position as everybody else in your league. Yeah, you just got to really feel out the league. Like if I'm – in the leagues that I'm on with like a bunch of like analysts and stuff – um, you kind of have to like go with the flow. Um, not that they're harder. <laughs> not that they're harder. I'm just saying like they they I think I think they tend to overvalue quarterbacks compared to uh, other leagues I'm in, which are just you know more casual and honestly sometimes even more fun. But what I will say is you have, would, to re- you have to react. Sorry to, to sorry to cut you off. I just I feel like uh, really what I've come to terms with is everybody everybody sucks at fantasy football, but the way that pe- the way that analysts and experts suck is just different than the way that the mainstream sucks yeah like none much. of them know what they're doing they just do it differently experts yeah. just spend more time rationalizing why they were wrong yeah Correct. you can exploit any group as long as you know like how they behave mm-hmm. um but i will say like when i if you guys get the chance to choose where you draft from 
that makes a huge difference. I always like to draft from the middle because then you can kind of like react to runs. Whereas if you draft on the end, let's say you draft at like the 1.1, 1.12 and the 201 and you pass on quarterback, you're not going to see another draft pick unless you move up until the bottom of the third. And by that time, like a lot of the stud quarterbacks can be gone. So that's why if you're in the middle, you can kind of react to a lot of that stuff. And it's kind of like Noah said, right? If you do react, yes, you do lose out a little bit of value at the other positions, but so does everyone else. So it's still like a level playing field. You don't, I, I don't like to leave the draft without having like two semi viable quarterbacks, even if they're like on the older side, but I do like to have at least two because trying to trade for them later, like even though you think that a Rob is better than like Drew Locke, for example, but when everyone only has like two to three quarterbacks, they're just like not willing to let it go. So you end up having to pay a pretty big premium. So do you, how would you rate, like how would you rank um, where you would like to pick in a startup draft? Like in t- say like, we'll just go beginning, middle, and you like middle best? I like the middle the best. Yeah. Unless, I think it's, I, unless it's tight end premium. I, I, I like think that. I like the end best. I think I like somewhere like the 110 range because going back to the point we talked about in terms of like trading your first round pick, I think when you get to the 110 ish range, that's like the perfect opportunity to trade picks because all the guys who pick like 101 to 104 have to wait so much longer to get back to their pick and people start getting antsy and there's not a big value drop off from the 110 to what you're about to probably end up trading for. So I think like when you when you pick early on, you're so excited for the startup draft, especially if it's your first dynasty one. I, I, I got to tell you, bro, like if you're drafting with your friends and stuff, like the startup drafts are, I don't want to say like sound weird and say emotional, but they like take a toll and like you get really fucking in, you get way more into the, the, the dynasty startup drafts than you would for like a redraft league. So I haven't like seen when, my family in weeks. I'm going to, I'm going to start up right now. I just haven't talked to anybody other than <laughs> that. That's what I mean. Like it, it, it's legit. Like you, they become like your family and shit. So you're so invested into it that you want to pick again. You're like, Oh, when's my pick? So when you're at the back half of the, uh, of the first round, like people want to trade up for it and you're not losing that much value because you already missed on all the elite options. So that's why I prefer the end of the first, I like a little, the end of the first. A little weird to think of that way, but. Yeah, because me personally, I'm just going to trade all my picks anyway. So if you have like the 110 and like the 203 or whatever, just trade the 110 for like a three and a five and then just trade the 203 for like a four and a six and then you own the middle rounds. It's like Scott's most patented move. Yeah. And when that time comes around, sure, you're going to miss out on those elite of the elite guys, but then you get to stack up on a bunch of really, really good players. And by the time the draft's over, you're going to look at your roster and you're going to have a much better team than everybody else who just stayed put and reacted to runs like Mike said or just were at the turn and they missed out on like 25 picks in a row because they had to wait so long. Yeah, and yeah. oftentimes when you hold a lot of those middle round picks, people that traded up to get those early round guys realize how badly they fucked up and they have to trade back down using those top assets. So you buy back at a discount. I'm telling you, it's emotional. I, I've cried. I've cried during the <laughs> draft before. Dude, it's so funny. Yannick will just DM me. He's like, I'm drunk, let's trade. I'm like, okay, yeah, this, this is the time to yeah, one cool, that, one cool that shit is real though. That shit really happens. Which is yeah. funny. Yeah. <laughs> one cool strat though is if you draft from the ends, like the 1.01 and or the 1.12, you can actually like start runs, and that's what I found like sometimes has worked. Whereas like if I'm just drafting at the end, I'll just take like two tight ends back to back, and then you'll see people react like, "Oh fuck, I don't have a tight end," or I'll take two quarterbacks, and people are like, "Oh fuck, I don't have a quarterback," and then you'll like you'll trigger runs, but it's kind of risky because if you try and trigger a run, it doesn't happen. You're just sitting there with the fucking sad, stupid look on your face. Because you reached for a quarterback too early. All right. Last two questions. We'll omit the 12th one. Uh, last two questions. I'll just combine it because it's kind of similar. The first one comes from Egmo. He says, would you rather have a top five rookie pick or Leonard Fournette? And then Ryan Stewart asks, would you take JT and Swift over Josh Jacobs? And I think we can just switch this question into basically where would you rank these top, let's say top four rookie running backs among running backs currently in the league and i have my rankings up right now so maybe i'll give you guys time to think if you weren't prepared for this question but i currently have jt as my running back eight in dynasty and swift as nine so i'm a fraud because my rankings say otherwise but i have them in the same tier as uh nick chubb joe mixon dalvin cook kamara and ezekiel elliott so i personally have those two above both josh jacobs and leonard fournette and i also have cam Akers above him and i have jk dobbins below those guys so where do you guys personally rank those top four tier one running backs at this point? Uh, mine's basically the same as yours, except I have Jacobs ahead of uh, Cam Akers for now. Yeah, I. Uh, it's so hard for me to – like I know Fournette. I even might have Fournette ranked above these guys in my actual rankings, but it's pretty much like telling people that it's okay to draft them there. But like I, I don't invest into players that I just don't 
like the long term view of. Didn't they like not pick up his fifth year option or something as well? So he only has mm-hmm. one year left on his deal. I, I don't even know. I I just think I, I he has one one year left. I'm not really sure the logistics behind the actual contract, but like I don't imagine him having that much value. Like after this year, I th- I think his value probably goes down in dynasty when none of those other guys' value is going to go down. Um, I just don't think he's that talented. So for Fournette. He's probably like personally, I would probably draft him last out of all these guys, even though I probably have him ranked above some of them. Um, and again, a couple of them will probably drop in the rankings pretty severely because two of them will end up in bad landing spots. Um, but for now, Fournette would probably be, I'll probably just throw him in as like number four in the rookie picks. So let's say like top three, you know, Swift, Taylor, um, whoever gets a better situation, then Fournette, and then probably the fifth one. And Jacobs would be, Jacobs would probably be in front of the fourth one as well. Uh, I think I would probably take Jacobs over Fournette right now. And did we add Miles Sanders in there? Uh, yeah. Where would you have Miles Sanders among those guys? Uh, probably the pick right in front of Jacobs. Oh, really? I have Miles Sanders actually below all of those guys as it is right now. I'm just not sure that he is like a workhorse back as these other guys are. And that kind yeah, of he's, tied into he's the never going to get the full workload. I don't think in Philly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to trust him when basically everything that you were preaching last offseason, Nick, about coaching matters, and we saw it come to fruition that he didn't get a starting job until Jordan Howard went down and that whole yeah. offense was dead. It's kind of hard to believe in him ever really getting like a 65 to 70% workload in that offense just because that's how they've run. And he's very efficient, but I'm not sure he gets the amount of touches or is efficient enough on those touches to really uh, be an elite fantasy running back, like a top 12 perennial guy. No, nah, Philly's adding weapons. I mean, Philly's going to add wide receivers. So if they don't, like, they got to fire that entire front office. So a lot more competition coming in for Sanders. I'm, I'm with you guys. Like, I just – I'm just not in on Fournette. Like, it, it honestly looks like the Jaguars are, like, tanking, right? Like, they're not really investing in winning right now. And Le- Le- Leonard Fournette is an asset that you would use to win right now. And he's shown he's had, like, bad history with the team. And, like, everyone's just banking on, like, TD regression saving things. But, like, he had a hundred targets, man. Like that's just not going to happen again. I yeah, it's it's like you have to rank him, but he's just you know he's on my do not draft list just based on the fact that I just don't think he has a bright future in the NFL. Like yeah. he'll be top ten, top twelve ranked for most people in dynasty, just because like you know where else you are you going to put him coming off of last year, just coming off the amount of volume that he had. But like I, he's just not someone I want on my team. Yeah, his three years have either been injury riddled or very inefficient or both. And like, who's going to want to pay for that? We saw Derrick Henry get tagged after having two really or a good back half of 2018 and an incredible 2019. And he gets a one year deal. Like, I don't see Leonard Fournette. Where, getting- where have you seen, where have you guys, because you guys have done startups this offseason. I'm assuming I haven't done any startup drafts. Where's Fournette going right now? Like third round? No, he went fourth, fifth in mine. Fourth or fifth. Fourth, fifth. Okay. Yeah. In super okay. So which would be, it'd be like third round in, in a single QB basically. Okay. Uh, I think that wraps it up for the questions. If you guys want to be featured in a future Q&A, uh, we'll be holding one, I think, once every other month. And then the other, every other month, we'll do a viewer-suggested video topic. So things that you guys want to see through the Discord, we'll post and we'll like notify everybody about it. You can suggest topics and we'll just talk about that on one show per month. So the next uh, Q&A will come sometime after the draft. So there'll probably be a bunch of questions about that. But Mike, I think now it's time to hit the narrative. Hit it. This week's narrative, old quarterbacks can't throw far. What do you guys have to say about this? Yo, Brady is going to go nuts this year. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's all I have to say. Like, people are like, he's not going to throw downfield. Like, what are you talking about? Brady's going to be like a top seven fantasy quarterback probably. Can I, can I ask a dynasty-related question? It just happened no. in my startup, and I keep referencing it, but – Think about this. Like, would you rather have Tom Brady in Dynasty or Teddy Bridgewater, who both probably have the same window of being starting quarterbacks? Tom Brady. That's not a it's not a bad way to put it. But yeah, that actually goes back to like when we were talking about drafting, how much you factor into age. You could use that with your quarterbacks too. Like if you want to yeah. if you want to draft like a you know, someone relatively solid for your QB one, like say you get Russell Wilson, right? He's like the QB six off the board. Then you end up taking a high upside guy like a Drew Locke in this, you know sixth seventh round you can get a drew Brees or a tom brady in like the 12th round and that's how that's how you mix veterans young players and shit like that especially at the quarterback but yeah i mean old guys the the only thing that holds back these old guys in terms of like people shitting on them is just they, they just look at like a pff number that's it they're like oh mm-hmm. he didn't complete that many deep passes it's like bro 
Tom Brady's weaponry that he worked with last year was the worst thing we've ever seen on a football field. Like yeah, what else Josh was Gordon was there. He wasn't not throwing to him deep down the field. Josh Gordon was getting a bunch of deep balls, and now yeah. he has a much better player in – or two much better players in Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. It's not like he's just not going to throw because that's just who he is. That's the offense he was in. It was two or three years ago he had Brandon Cooks, and Brandon Cooks was like a fringe wide receiver one. And I'm not – was a wide receiver one. Wide receiver yeah. 12, I think. And I don't think anybody's questioning that Mike Evans is a better player than Brandon Cooks. So, I, like, yeah. argument that he can't throw deep or like Drew Brees can't throw deep – I think that's more just the offense that they have, and they've had success in it. Now he's going to Bruce Arians, a guy who likes to air it out. Like, Carson Palmer was throwing friggin' 95 deep balls a game. Like, what's to say Tom Brady doesn't just flip the script and throw it up to a six foot five receiver who's just dominated for the past six years? Yeah, but I think it's a, it's a function of the weaponry, right? Like, I mean, Godwin led the league in deep, uh, deep catches last year. Evans, we know, is really good there. This is probably, like, one of the best wide receiver cores he's – Brady's ever had to work with outside of like did Moss and Welker overlap I forget I'm pretty sure they did oh, they both sucked anyways it didn't matter <laughs> yeah so <laughs> on top of that you know you got Bruce Arians who likes to throw it deep I think the only question mark for me is how this O-line is going to hold up because their O-line is not very good yeah neither and was Brady, the pass last year though so I don't think it really yeah happened. Brady does need a and you know Brady did struggle last year so the, the other thing the too I, I hear a lot of people and I'm not sure if this is right or not but I hear a lot of people citing the fact that uh you know, the, the O-line in New England wasn't that bad and he had a hard time getting the ball out of his hand. But you could look at that from the opposite way. Like, the guys that he was throwing to couldn't separate. You know, he had such a poor weapons group. And now running with guys like Evans and Godwin, they're going to be able to get off the line in, in no time, right? So he'll have, even if he has less time under pressure or if he had you know, more, more crowded backfields and the guys are pressuring him, like, he'll be able to get the, the, the ball quicker because he'll see his guys separating. So, uh, for Brady, I'm not worried about him. But, I mean, there are other guys like, you know, Phillip Rivers. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, no, Nick, you can I, throw it deep. It's just not accurate. He'll just, he'll just <laughs> throw it deep whenever he wants. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Okay. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think most quarterbacks' arms just, like, end up falling off towards the end of their career. I think it's a, a matter of the offensive scheme starting to tailor themselves around what traits they have, what traits are their strengths at that point? Yeah. You know? A lot of interviews that I saw with like Troy Aikman and uh, Dan Marino and guys like that, they always say that they could still chuck it today, but it's their legs that went because you're taking like from under center, like a, you're basically like squatting like a hundred times a game. Right. So True. once you get older, that's a lot tougher. So I don't, I'm not too worried about Brady's arm. So as long as the O line kind of holds up long enough and guys get open, I think he could be like a pretty sneaky productive asset. I have Brady on one of my championship teams. So I'm hoping he, uh, steps up this year yeah we saw that out of phil rivers i mean he has 11 kids his legs were gone longer (laughs) fair enough all right (laughs) that's gonna uh wrap up this week's episode of bunk bed breakdowns we are going to keep y'all entertained throughout this quarantine which is going to end up lasting way closer to like eight months than it is eight days i'm sorry people that really think we're about to get out of our house in about 10 10 days that shit ain't happening but what is happening is a, an incredible amount of quality and quantity out of Big Dog's Gotta Eat. I promise you we are there for y'all. We're going to get you through these hard times. Make sure you are subscribed to us everywhere. YouTube, iTunes, Twitch, Twitter. It'll all be linked below. But more importantly, make sure you join Discord because we need y'all's ADP data. We need your credit card info. We need your social security number. <laughs> Mother's maiden name. We need it all. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's it. Make sure you uh, smash that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We'll be back next Wednesday with another Bunk Bed Breakdowns. And as long as you're following us, you'll be able to uh, get notified of whatever content we put out in between. Peace. Peace. can't be yelling in this house oh <laughs> that's true i mean your volume <laughs> never gets above a fucking three anyway <laughs> if not i have not stopped drinking fucking I'm, I'm having like seven cups a day like I, as if i have somewhere to go <laughs> <laughs> that like push up thing uh no it was a beast yeah so actually <laughs> i cannot wait till people see you in person for the first time I know it's gonna be funny. They probably think i'm like 5 eight and like they, they definitely, yeah they think you're probably like tiny <laughs> no beard and you're gonna stand next to me and they're gonna be like nick's a little bitch <laughs> you're right though all right all right all right <laughs>